Welcome to Educational Alpha. I'm Bill Kelly, CEO of Kai Association, and your host, bringing you on-the-ground conversations with business leaders, educators, and industry colleagues from around the globe. Educational Alpha is sponsored by iCapital, the financial technology company with the mission to power the world's alternative investment marketplace. Part innovator, part educator, and part navigator of the alternatives industry, iCapital offers intuitive, scalable digital solutions that have transformed how private market and hedge fund investments are bought and sold. With iCapital, financial advisors, wealth managers, and asset managers around the world now have access to everything they need to deliver the return and diversification potential of alternatives to high net worth investors. To learn more, visit iCapital.com. In today's episode, Bill Kelly is joined by the CEO of the Financial Planning Association, Patrick Mahoney. A wealth of knowledge in the industry, Patrick shares his insights on the intricacies of the ever-evolving financial planning profession, including the most pressing matters surrounding it today. Patrick draws insightful comparisons with established fields like dentistry, emphasizing the critical importance of education and credentials in shaping varying levels of expertise. Get ready to absorb valuable insights as we navigate the complex realm of financial planning. Listen in. Patrick Mahoney, welcome to Educational Alpha. Thank you, Bill. Nice to be with you today. Pleasure is mine. And we have a lot to talk about, most notably an important partnership. And we're going to get into that. And I have great appreciation and admiration for that, the signing of that relationship and what it stands for. But before we get into that, maybe a little bit of background on who Patrick Mahoney is. And I did look a little bit at your bio, and it seems like you've been in this space in terms of mission-based organizations, a good part of your career. So I think they chose well when they put you in charge of the uh, FPA, but maybe a little bit on your background. Happy to do it. I'm currently, I have the privilege of being the CEO of the Financial Planning Association. My exposure to the financial planning, financial services industry began in 1998 when I was recruited to Standard & Poor's as a product manager for one of their structured finance vehicles. I moved along in that organization. I was there for a very long time. And towards the end of my tenure there, maybe about eight or nine years in, I was there for about 15 years. About halfway through, about the halfway mark, I was the lead managing director for the commercial aspects of the institutional relations that we had on the broker-dealer side. And one of the things that you get very involved in with in structured finance or things like CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and and that ties in very much with alternative investments. I left s and I was recruited to go to move to the not-for-profit space as a chief marketing officer. And then from there, my career navigated here until one day I got a call from your good people to talk about alternative investments, something that I had great exposure to earlier in my career, but had not looked at in a long time. But the minute I uh, signed up for your portfolio, and I actually took the first two courses on my own. It all came roaring back. And my familiarity with it, private equity, debt, hedge funds, real estate, commodities, the things that are lightly regulated, if regulated at all, that's not a bad thing. But what hasn't changed much is the need for education. And that's what piqued my interest in terms of what this alliance between our two organizations can do. Because as you know, there's a lot of research out there that people are migrating towards evaluating clients' requests to consider alternative investments. And then a planner has to make the decision either to encourage them or sometimes dissuade them from pursuing that. But you can't do that unless you're educated yourself. And that's where I saw an opportunity for our planners to get educated. That's how we moved along. I was recruited to FPA four years ago as their CEO on an interim basis. And then I took the job permanently about nine months later, and I've been here ever since. We're a trade association focused on representing financial planners nationwide. We have about 18,000 members across all 50 states. And uh, we do a lot. We focus on how we can help our members burnish up the practice support mechanisms of their office, either front office or back office. We provide learning opportunities, which is what we're talking about here. 
Then we get into advocacy, which are things like title protection and financial wellness and literacy and all that good stuff. And then, of course, the we talk about networking and the lifeblood of an advisor is be able to network with other advisors and conferences and things like that. So we kind of run the whole gamut on behalf of our members. But my big push the last few years has been focusing on burnishing up the value of membership. And the way to do that is to offer programs and services that help you run your practice better and also give you learning opportunities to help you be a better planner. And so for those planners are committed to professional development, things like this alliance that you and I are talking about this morning are right up our alley. So uh, maybe just one point of clarification, and there's quite a bit to work with there. So you've got the CFP board, which I think for want of a better description, provides, I believe, the examination or at least parts of it, maybe some of it's in the university. But are you a separate membership body? So I go through the CFP program through the CFP board, and then separately, I come to FPA and join as a member. Is that correct? That's right. The CFP board is the accrediting body to give you the CFP credential. They have a very well, robust, well-defined training program, and they administer the exam. They administer the continuing education credits required to keep the credential once you've earned it. But they're all about managing that credential and converting as many people as they can to be what they call certificates. FPA is where you go It's kind of like medical school or law school. You get your degree and then you join the AMA or the ABA or a local society. And that's where FPA comes in. The Financial Planning Association is for credential planners who are applying their trade out in the field to help American households have a more mature and secure lifetime financial plan. But we kind of take them after they get certified. I think the nature and the purpose of both what you do and maybe by proxy what Kaya does has never been more important in that if you think about the base case for diversification, the institutions, certainly the more sophisticated ones, adopted the endowment model many decades ago and off they went. That space has gotten a lot more challenging. Performance dispersion is very, very wide. Manager selection matters a lot. But, but if you look at the pie of who owns assets globally, the individual is slightly in the majority now, and that's going to accelerate. We're not minting any new defined benefit plans or sovereign wealth funds. So the big GPs, as an example, are now looking on high net worth and maybe even the mass affluent as potential capital flow into their products. And as I think about diversification, that's not a bad thing. But if it's not done through the lens of education and informed consent, it's going to end very, very badly. So I think that you and your organization might be the first line of defense to some degree. And that's a very high obligation that you folks have taken on. And, and you mentioned a moment ago this concept of title protection and really trying to, or maybe I can have you explain that, but I think you're really trying to bring professionalism right to the fore and really make that sort of the mantra of what you're trying to accomplish. I commend you for doing it. It's not an easy task, but maybe describe what title protection is and and how you're looking to accomplish it. Title protection for the term financial planner is a very simple concept. Bill, anybody today can hang out a shingle and call themselves a financial planner. You don't need a license. You don't need to take an exam. You can just call yourself one. But we'll be under you to your client if they walk in thinking that you're offering a service for which you've been trained and certified and accredited, even from a bare threshold standard. We began to look at that and say, you know, what can we be doing to represent our planners better to protect their title? And really, at the end of the day, title protection is about protecting your right to merit use of the title. You shouldn't be able to call yourself a financial planner unless you can represent to a client that you're in the arena for them, that you have training, that you're educated, that you're not selling them something. You're selling them a security in their future. That's a different topic. But there's a mishmash of people out there that are are selling commodities or selling insurance, but they're not using financial planning as a product per se. It's an avenue to get a hook into the client. And there's nothing wrong with that from a technical perspective, as long as you go in with eyes wide open. But to represent yourself as a financial planner should require more than just calling yourself, waking up one morning and deciding you want to be a financial planner. So that's where that's where the concept came from. 
Cerulean Associates had a study out about a year and a half ago. It was like a $90 trillion transfer of wealth between one generation to the next. And when you boil that down to Saturday morning conversations at the kitchen table across American households, and you are thinking of transferring or deciding how to transfer your wealth to your children, there ought to be two financial planners with you at that table, one for you and one for them. One to help you give it away and one for, to help you receive it and receive it with thrift and prudence and good judgment and discretion. The same that you exercise through the course of your life to build the wealth that you now are fortunate to transfer. That's a huge responsibility for the people that are assisting you, what we call financial planners. And they bring education, they bring a threshold competencies, they bring knowledge and awareness. And they're in the arena for you, not for themselves. That's the big thing. And that's a hard, is that sometimes a hard concept to get people around? The trick is that we don't want to institute any undue or additional regulation. There's enough regulation in this industry that affects all of us, as you well know. So how do we strike that right balance where we're protecting the title financial planner, but at the same time, we're raising the dialogue of financial planning education in the United States for the average American, and how are we doing that in a responsible way? So that's the thrust of the initiative. It's going to take a long time. As you talked about, it's very well-baked. The industry is very, very old, but it's still evolving. And that's the great thing about financial e planning, financial services ecosystem. It's constantly on the move. We're talking about alternative investments. That, that's something that's been around for a long time, but not necessarily for the common man or woman. It more and more now it is, but the onus is upon us that are helping those folks to keep them educated. And in my case, keeping our planners, giving them the opportunity to get educated so they could do a better job with their clients. Going back to title protection, that's the thrust of it. There is no common standard. There's no federal standard. There are some states that regulate it. They tie it into financial advisor regulation, but it's a mishmash. And it's created kind of a little bit of a chaotic situation as to who can call themselves a planner. And I think there both lies maybe the opportunity and some of the challenge. And my first exposure to credentialing was over 40 years ago. And I got out of college. I went to work for Pricewaterhouse. And, and I didn't think about the CPA as a credential. It was part of the uniform. And if you're going to be in public accounting, you had to get your CPA. So it has its issues and challenges, and we've talked about this before in this podcast, but accounting is a profession. And if I'm going to have somebody do my tax return, I should pretty clearly know, am I just getting a tax preparer or is it a CPA? And I think most people can understand that. And I think when it comes to the credentialing side in financial services, there are just so many credentials. You go to your, the FINRA website, I think there's over 300 of them listed there. Two-thirds of them begin with the letter C, and most of them have certified or chartered in them. So it's even hard to distinguish amongst ourselves what we're doing. But again, around this transfer of wealth that you just mentioned, that is going to be a massive sea change to every family balance sheet. And it's interesting, and again, maybe this is part of the challenge, Patrick, that if I think about RIAs, I don't know if this is true of CFPs or not, but I think I've seen stats about the average RIA is a white male, maybe in his 50s or 60s. So not only is the retirement's a big issue. Yeah. So they're servicing the baby boomer at the same time, the assets are being transferred over. I think this next generation and the good news side, they're much more socially aware, much more environmentally aware, much more impact aware. And they want advice, but do we have the right body of people coming up behind them to transfer? And I, I see in many cases, I work with a financial planner myself and my kids, I don't think they're going to use the same financial planner because that's sort of a dad's guy and my wants and needs are different than their wants and needs. So I think there's a lot of moving parts here. And do you feel the demographics coming up is the back end of this pipe producing enough CFPs to handle this transfer of wealth as these current crop age out? No, that's a concern. And that's why my good friend, Kevin Keller of the CFP board is working so hard to build that pipeline up. And that's why those of us that are allied with them in the industry are working so hard with educational institutions that have defined undergraduate degree programs in personal financial planning. But it's all about 
raising the awareness of the profession itself. But you bring up a really good point, though. Like, you know, my kids are all out of college and are on their own. And I insisted that as a father can do once in a while, you can play the guilt card and you need to get a financial planner. Well, wouldn't you know, they didn't want mine. They wanted someone that looked like them. So with my daughters, they wanted a woman and they wanted someone closer to their age. The job was to find a competent, professional financial planner who happened to be a lady who was in her early to mid thirties. And they're out there, but that's what their filter was. Not the pedigree, not the school they went to, not how successful they are, not how much AUM they're managing. They really wanted to connect personally with someone to help them figure out what they wanted to do. And of course, the, the secret of all this is that all the advice that they're getting from this financial planner is the same that dad has been giving for 25 years. But you hear it from somebody else, it's not your father saying, so anyway, that, that's good for them. But we see a lot of that around the country where we have younger planners coming in and there's this issue of relevance to them. How is the profession relevant to the life they want to lead? You're right. They're far more altruistic than their forebears were at the same age just 30 years ago. We were all about climbing the ladder and making money. They're all about making money, but doing it in a way that makes sense and makes them feel whole that they're making contribution to society. It's a healthy perspective that they have, but the demand to help them find that is what can be elusive. And I think with both doctors and financial planners, you don't want to outlive them. <laughs> you want somebody. That's true. To... <laughs> That's very true. Especially the doctors, clearly. So you mentioned trying to capture the hearts, minds, and souls very early on. And I think that's a critical point. And I think a challenge, certainly for, for Kai as an example, is that you don't go and major in alternative investments, but you can go and be pre-law, pre-med. You can major in accounting. So I think a lot of these professions have a degree-based program that sinks right up into that profession. And I've seen some of these analyses, and maybe the CFP does this. I'm not a big fan of it, but well, if I get my credential, how much more is it going to earn me? And some organizations put studies out there that show the average C blank blank makes more than the slob that doesn't have it in the first place. And I say, well, it's not so much what the credential is going to do for you, but what does it stand for? What does it mean vis-a-vis -vis professionalism? And the thought of going to have a cavity filled by somebody that is not a professional dentist is crazy. But then is it equally crazy to entrust uh, whatever my nest egg is to somebody that may not even have a college degree? And I think if you break it down in that basic terms, most people would agree with you. But then trying to figure out how we make this into something that's good for the profession coming in, and maybe you can comment on that and maybe to complicate it a little bit more. I'm curious to know both your thoughts on that challenge, but then has COVID made it even more difficult? And I say that from the standpoint that now some firms like Goldman Sachs and others are mandating back five days a week. We'll see how that works out. But not only back five days a week, you better sit for the CFP at the same time too, and you better do that on the weekends because I'm paying you 40 or 50 hours a week when you're in the office. So it seems like the ability to get people focused on credentialing is even more challenging. Well, that's a lot to unpack, but I'll start off with the analogy that you gave about going to the dentist. And it's illustrative of the issue. My father and my grandfather were both dentists. They both got their dental degrees in Pennsylvania. My grandfather in 1930, my father in 1965. The difference of those 35 years is that when my grandfather got his degree, you could go to your barber and get your tooth pulled. There were no standards. There were no examination boards. There was no license to practice dentistry. There was no license to attain the ability to prescribe medication for someone that had a toothache. It was the Wild West at the time. His class at the University of Pittsburgh in 1930 was the first class that actually had an accredited standard educational symposium that they had to follow. Now, 32, 35 years later, when his son decided to be a dentist, all of a sudden you could, oh, and my grandfather didn't have a bachelor's degree. He worked for a couple of years in the coal mines out in Western Pennsylvania at a high school and then decided to be a dentist. And that was good enough. 35 years later, the profession if you're picking up on my theme here, had matured. And now my father had to have a bachelor's degree in some kind of underpinning science that supported that profession. He had to sit for a standard national exam and a state exam. 
he had to be licensed by the state of Pennsylvania. He had to sit for a pharmaceutical license to prescribe medication. We had to join a local dental society. He had to pay dues. He had to commit to continuing education. This, in his father's time, was unheard of. No one even thought about it that way. But that was the progression of that profession over a third of a century, right? When you apply that same analogy to this, how do you invoke passion in a young person? You make them want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And the best way to do that is to be part of a profession. This profession that you labor in is a noble profession, but it's not recognized as one. And therein lies the challenge. And how can you convey to those American households who are moving all that money around that you're in the arena for them unless you can represent to them that you're part of a profession that's designed to serve them? And that's the challenge that we have. Financial planners just aren't recognized as a profession, even though they've been acting as one for over 25, 30 years now. But at some point, and we just really haven't tackled it because it's difficult to do. Nobody wants to have another three letters after the name. No one wants to have to sit after an exam. Nobody wants to have additional regulation. And so we just kind of accept it as it is. But that's not helping the consumer because there's a lot of consumer misinformation out there. There's a lot of consumer confusion out there. And the only way to do that, to address it properly, is with the professionalism of a profession and the education that goes with it. And so when you think about it from that little analogy I gave you about dental school, the same thing can apply to financial planners, but it doesn't, but it should. And that's kind of the argument that we're making. It's a long journey that we're going to be on because there's a lot of vested interests out there that just no one really disagrees with the premise. They just don't want all the additional stuff that goes with it. Then I get it. But at the same time, we have this 300 million Americans out there that everyone needs a financial plan where they should have one. And how do you go about doing that? And for me and for FPA, it's all about education, education, education. I thought, but before I leave this line of questioning, quickly, your thoughts on COVID. I think that that's changed the world in many ways in terms of active engagement. I think maybe we have to get through this current season. And it seems so long ago we were wearing masks, but has that changed and made your job more difficult? I just got over COVID last weekend. So I personally went through the last two and a half years unscathed. I got every vaccination, every booster that came out. And all last weekend, I came down with it. Couldn't believe it. I was in shock. And it knocked me flat for a week. And I got it, I think, at a public event. So the concern is, I think COVID changed the way America works. It changes the way America engages. We prove to ourselves that we can leverage technology to pivot to achieve our deliverables. What we sacrificed though, I came up the line where you interacted with your colleagues and every promotion I ever got, I always earned, but I'm not naive enough to think that I didn't benefit from FaceTime with the people that were making those evaluations about me. That's gone. You can have Jamie Dion and others say that if you can go out to dinner, you can go to the office and that's not inaccurate. But the the genie's out of the bottle and it's not going to go back because people have demonstrated they can leverage technology to do their jobs efficiently and properly. Look at us. Where are you right now? Cape Cod. So not in an office. Yeah. I'm in Denver, Colorado. You wouldn't know it. So we're using technology to do good stuff and to advance programs and to generate business and to run operations and all those things. And I don't think that's going to disappear anytime soon. And you got a generation coming up the line that really value this work-life balance. As long as I get the job done, what do you care? And that's kind of the prevailing attitude. And I didn't like it in the beginning. I have to admit, personally, I wasn't crazy about it. But when the governor of Colorado shut down the state, what was I supposed to do? And I'm not unique among CEOs. Everybody's had to deal with this, including you guys. So it's, it's... changed the way we approach work. It's changed the way we approach work relationships. It has definitely changed the way we approach networking. People go to conferences. Maybe they don't go to as many or they're more selective. And there's always this concern in the back of a person's mind of what they're exposing themselves to, particularly if you can get CE online, particularly if you can do your job virtually. 
If I got a client and I got to interview her kids as part of their estate planning for their parents, I can get a FaceTime interview with everybody all within a couple of minutes and they're all around the world and you get it done. That's a positive thing. I don't know that the country has fully digested the ramifications of that. I do think that what COVID's taken away is the social fabric of our ability to engage one-on-one, to come up with ideas. And I think somehow the pendulum has to swing back into the middle, but it hasn't yet. Yeah, I agree. And I just hope that professionalism doesn't take a permanent backseat and that uh, of the many things I'm negotiating with my employer about food trucks parked outside and maybe it'll come in five days a week. I think professionalism has got to be part of it too, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. So you said something interesting before about professionalism, and I don't know if you do any lobbyist work, but I'll give you an example. Your job and mine would be so much easier if the SEC and FINRA said, we're going to change the definition of accredited investor. But if you're giving financial advice, you must be a CFP. And if it involves alternative investments, you must be a Kaya. Now, all of a sudden, professionalism, uh, the light switch has been turned on and you and I are in a very good place. I think what I see happening, and we saw this in the last go around a year or two ago, where the SEC and FINRA are loosening up the definition of accredited investor, but it got down to one of these licensing exams by FINRA, which I don't consider that necessarily a high stakes exam. That's somebody who's going into a selling role right out of college with a little bit of studying can get through. I don't think it's got the heft and the breadth of your program or mine, but what is the role of regulation or legislation when it comes to bringing professionalism to this industry? Because we're going to allow just unfettered access to alternatives without any rules of the road. It's going to end very well for the GPs, but I think very less well for the ultimate clients you and I serve. At the end of the day, I think if everybody's North Star is what's best for the consumer, will land on the right spot. I think sometimes that gets lost in translation. We forget that at the end of the day, there's somebody in Paducah, Iowa, that is relying on you and on me for good advice so that they don't end up destitute in their old age and they're financially secure. And they didn't go to school to do this kind of work. They're sophisticated in lots of things and life in particular, but not necessarily in this. And they're humble enough to recognize that they need help and they're coming to us for help. That's a responsibility as well as as a privilege. And if we keep our eye on them as the ultimate beneficiaries of what we do, and we keep that North Star in mind, that consumer protection and is what matters the most, then we'll land in the right spot. But I think sometimes... I watch a lot of things and I read a lot of literature and it seems sometimes we kind of get off that mark a little bit. But if we keep our focus on what's best for the consumer, we're always going to land in the right place. Historically, as a country, when it comes to financial vehicles, when we do that, we do well. When we lose the focus on what's best for the consumer, then we sort of go off on these outlying tangents and sometimes people get in trouble and sometimes they don't. But if we focus on what's best for the consumer at the end of the day, we're always going to land on our feet. So that was so good. I'm going to accept all that at face value without any challenge. So uh, well put, Patrick. So maybe the remaining minutes, a little bit of a plug for me and for both of us, maybe on an important topic, which is what we talked about this last 30 minutes, education. And this is what we've been doing and a huge part of what you do as well. Now, you have members to serve and we do as well. And you've got to serve them in many, many different ways, but equipping them with ongoing continuous education is critically important. And we saw the advent of democratization. We had a credential that's focused largely on the institutional allocator, but it was a different set of wants and needs when it came to the CFP or more broadly, the RIA. So we rolled this unified platform out as early days and through uh, Aaron Philback and you and your team, you were willing to take a bet on us and a bet on education. And I doubt it was the first time you've done this, but I want to first off say thank you. And then maybe understand how important education is to the service you're delivering to your members. I assume it's everything to some degree, but maybe just a little bit of your thoughts on how important education is. The battle scars for me were formed in the great credit crisis of 2007 and eight, 
when I was at S&P and we had people investing in investment vehicles that didn't understand what they were investing in. And there was a dearth of education at the time. And I and others were too close to it to fully appreciate that. But in retrospect, had there been more of a premium place on education, both at the investor side, but also on the consumer side, perhaps much of that drama could have been avoided. Fast forward all these years later, what picked my interest when I ran into you folks was the focus on education and the responsibility that you all take culturally. I mean, this is like in your bones and your DNA. You really, it comes across very clearly. You really believe this. And it's fundamental to the mission over at Kaya. And that's what, what's what attracted me so much to it. For my folks, our financial planners, they're equally tied to education. But first, they had to educate themselves. And that was the benefit here. That's why I liked it. When I looked at the fundamental of alternative investments, I took the first two courses on my own. I signed up for them. And they were not easy, but they're not designed to be easy, right? But I thought to myself, if I can do this and I'm not a planner, how much of a benefit this would be to planners who then have to educate their clients, go or no go, depending on what the situation is. So I think from an edu- from a from a broader 20,000 foot level, the focus on education is as tantamount to this industry. And it will be the bellwether for success for FPA and for Kaya. I agree. And that 90 trillion you mentioned earlier from the Cerulli reports, I think those first waves are hitting the beat. So the timing is spot on. And I think we have a, certainly challenges ahead of us. But if we got nothing else right, I think we got the timing right. And hopefully uh, with a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work and partners like you rowing in the same direction, I think my goal is to keep my oar moving as fast as yours. I think the investor, the client will be in a better place. So, uh, so Patrick, uh, great discussion. Uh, thanks for the partnership and thanks for joining me today. You're very welcome and best of luck to you. And we'll be working with together going forward. Thank you for listening to Educational Alpha. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Learn more about the Kaya Association and subscribe to the show at kaya.org. That's C-A-I-A.org. See you next time.